Have you ever wondered how the prophecies of the apocalypse apply directly to your life today? In a world full of uncertainties, the final book of the Bible offers not only revelations about the future, but a personal invitation to transformation. The book of Revelation, the ultimate section of the Holy Scriptures, unveils visions and revelations granted by the Almighty to the Apostle John. These visions are intricately linked to the present days, to the end times. A time characterized by profound transformations in society and on the earth, foreshadowing the advent of the Antichrist and the calamitous events of the Tribulation period. However, dear ones, the purpose of these prophecies is not to instill fear, but to motivate us to live for Christ, interpreting these apocalyptic revelations as warnings and preparations for what is imminent. Therefore, let us delve, beloved, into the book of Revelation. This enigmatic and, for many, even somewhat intimidating portion of our Bible, which is not there by chance. The Lord does not insert anything in His Word without a significant purpose. If He chose to unveil to us all that the Apostle John witnessed, it is because there is something crucial that He wants us to understand and take seriously. When we mention the Apocalypse, many people immediately imagine catastrophes and chaos. But attention, the denomination Apocalypse derives from the Greek Apocalypsis, which means revelation. Therefore, it is not about the end of the world itself, but about the revelation of how things will unfold until we reach the great conclusion of this narrative that we are all experiencing. Currently, as we observe the world around us, we notice transformations in all aspects, technological innovations emerging at every moment, international relations becoming increasingly strained, not to mention the persistent environmental challenges. Sacred Scripture already warned us that these would be the signs of the end times. However, it is not time to succumb to panic. At the heart of the Apocalypse, precisely in chapter 9, we encounter the sixth trumpet, a celestial resonance that announces not only a verdict, but also an invitation to introspection. When the sixth angel sounded his trumpet, a voice resounded from the four corners of the golden altar before the Almighty, commanding the release of the four angels restrained by the mighty river Euphrates. This episode transports us to an atmosphere where divine justice prepares to manifest itself in an unprecedented way in human history. As we reflect on the narratives of Revelation chapter 9, we perceive the gravity of the moment depicted. Visualize the sound of a trumpet reverberating through the heavens, not as a simple event, but as a warning, a sign that something of utmost importance is about to unfold, in this case, the proclamation of divine judgment. However, it is also, observe, a chance for us to ponder our conduct. The voice that John heard, emanating from the four corners of the golden altar, speaks directly to us, urging us to awaken, to look around, and to evaluate if our way of life is in accordance with what God desires from us. The choices we make today, the actions we undertake, all of this will reverberate into the future. Now, as for these four angels restrained by the river Euphrates, have you considered the significance of this? Scriptures do not mention details without relevance. The river Euphrates carries colossal importance in biblical chronology, from Eden to becoming one of the central stages of the final events. And these angels, who were confined, symbolize crucial elements in this divine plot. This reinforces the notion that the Lord exercises absolute dominion over good and evil, and nothing escapes His sovereignty. The command to release these angels, issued by the sixth angel when he sounded the trumpet, marks a turning point, as if the divine were proclaiming the decisive moment to identify who truly stands by His side. This is equally an invitation to reflect on our belief our surrender to God, 
and how we are contributing to the advancement of his kingdom here on earth. Regarding the four angels detained by the river Euphrates, this issue urges us to explore not only physical geography, but also spirituality and the history of the angelic insurrection. These angels, unlike celestial messengers such as Michael and Gabriel, are entities that chose to rebel alongside Lucifer, thus becoming fallen angels destined to fulfill an evil role at a critical moment in human history. As we delve deeper into the issue of the four angels confined by the Euphrates, we begin to unravel more about the ongoing spiritual plot. It is not simply a narrative of good versus evil, as often portrayed in cinematic productions, but a complex story related to the decisions these angels made during the revolt orchestrated by Lucifer. This being, once an entity of unparalleled light and splendor, was consumed by pride and aspired to usurp God's throne, which resulted in his fall from heaven, along with all the angels who allied with him in the rebellion. Currently, we are faced with these four detained angels, awaiting the moment to be released to play a terrible role. The task entrusted to these angels, unveiled during the echo of the sixth trumpet, carries unprecedented gravity. Once unleashed from the Euphrates, these spiritual beings will be invested with the authority to exterminate a significant fraction of humanity. The mention of the Euphrates River is emblematic, symbolizing not only a geographical demarcation, but also a spiritual boundary whose violation will alter the course of history. These angels, in contrast to God's divine messengers, represent a force of destruction and an expression of divine judgment, permitted by God as a reaction to the accumulation of human rebellion against his precepts. The mission entrusted to these imprisoned angels, who upon being unleashed, will have the power to decimate a third of the world's population, is profoundly unsettling. The Euphrates River, mentioned in this passage, transcends its geographical representation. In the Bible, it is laden with symbolism, historically serving as a boundary for the people of Israel, delineating the known from the unknown, the safe from the dangerous. Here in the apocalypse, it emerges again, but this time as a spiritual boundary, the crossing of which by the angels will mark a watershed moment in human history. Reflecting on these angels, we realize that they differ significantly from the more familiar angels, those messengers of God or protectors we are accustomed to hearing about. These angels have a distinct mission. They are instruments of divine judgment, a direct response from God to the accumulated human rebellion over the centuries. It's as if God is setting a limit showing that humanity has crossed boundaries and ignored his commandments and will now face the consequences. However, even in the face of such a grave revelation, we must not lose sight of God's love and mercy. For even in times of judgment, his love remains present. God does not delight in the death of the wicked, but desires that all should repent and live. The release of these angels and the consequent destruction should not be seen only as acts of judgment, but as a call to repentance. God, in his infinite mercy, always precedes his acts of justice with warnings and opportunities for us to turn to him. Just as in the days of Noah, when the ark remained open until the time of the flood, Today, we are called to find refuge in Christ before the doors of grace close. As we meditate on the release of these angels and the havoc they will wreak, it is tempting to focus solely on fear and ruin. However, there is a deeper message. The divine is using this as a final recourse, a call for us to awaken and realize that the path we are on may not be the right one. The story of Noah is emblematic. Faced with widespread wickedness, the Lord provided an opportunity for contrition. 
Noah dedicated years to the construction of the ark and to warning the people, but many individuals disregarded the warnings, continuing with their lives as if nothing significant was about to happen. The magnitude of the angelic army, described in Revelation as composed of 200 million, highlights the gravity and worldwide scope of the impending judgment. This formidable force not only symbolizes the capacity for devastation that will be unleashed, but also mirrors the vast number of souls that still need to turn to God in contrition and faith. Therefore, as we learn about this army of 200 million angels, we should look beyond the initial dread. This quantity, which may seem terrifying, actually reveals to us the greatness of God's love and tolerance. It represents a reminder that in a world with a population significantly exceeding 200 million, there are countless people who still need to hear the gospel, to know God's affection, to repent, and to live by faith. This revelation in the book of Revelation, besides highlighting the destructive power that accompanies the verdict, reflects the urgent call for the church to act. It's as if the Lord is directly conveying to us, Behold, I am patient, I am waiting. However, the moment is approaching, and before it arrives, I desire that all have the opportunity to turn to me. The most lamentable aspect of the events outlined in Revelation 9 does not lie solely in the destruction perpetrated by the angels, but in the obstinacy of the remaining humanity, which, even in the face of the undeniable evidence of divine judgment, refuses to repent of its iniquities. This is a somber call to reflect on human nature and the imperative of contrition. As we delve deeper into the analysis of Revelation 9, we are profoundly moved not only by the destruction, which in itself is devastating, but by what it reveals about people's reactions. In the midst of all the chaos, we witness an indifference that tears at the soul. It seems that even with the world crumbling around them and clear signs that God is seeking to awaken humanity, many still choose to keep their hearts sealed. They witness the devastation, experience the consequences of their choices, but instead of turning to God, they cling even more to their lives apart from Him. This behavior, my brothers and sisters, should lead us to introspection about our own lives, about the moments when God tried to capture our attention and we, well, decided to ignore. This insensitivity is not a recent phenomenon. We see it occur many times in Scripture. From the times of Egypt, when Pharaoh refused to heed Moses, to Jonah trying to escape the mission God had assigned him, History repeats itself, showing that we often prefer to cling to the familiar, even if it distances us from God. These apocalyptic events, though terrible in their description, are part of God's redemptive plan. They act as an ultimatum for people to recognize His sovereignty and turn to Him, abandoning their paths of rebellion. It is a call for us to reevaluate where we are placing our faith and how we are responding to divine appeals in our lives. When faced with the adversities and challenges of the world, it is essential to remember that God's grace and mercy remain accessible, awaiting our return and genuine repentance. Divine judgment is always a manifestation of reluctance, a final response after numerous opportunities of grace and mercy. As we examine the events described in Revelation, it is easy to be captured by the grim perspective of judgment and destruction. However, it is crucial to look beyond that. God, in His essence, is love, mercy, and grace. He does not rejoice in suffering nor desires the perdition of anyone. The difficult narrative, the one that discusses judgment and destruction, serves a greater purpose. It is a call of love. God has offered throughout the entire Bible repeated chances for His people to return to Him from the times of Adam and Eve through Noah, Moses, the prophets, to the coming of Jesus. 
Each episode of history is a mark of divine patience and hope, longing for us to understand his love and choose to live in harmony with it. Therefore, the apocalyptic events can be interpreted as an ultimatum, yes, but from a father who has already tried all possible approaches. He has sent messages, shown signs, made and fulfilled promises, and now he is inviting us. Children, please understand. It is time to come home. Let go of rebellion, this life that will not lead you anywhere of value. God executes his judgment with deep reluctance, not out of desire, but because his perfect justice cannot ignore sin. However, even in moments of judgment, God's mercy and grace are eminent, waiting until the last possible moment, offering every opportunity so that no one is lost. This apocalyptic scenario should not incite fear in us, but rather vigilance and holiness. We are called to live in a way that reflects our hope in Christ, our faith in his return, and our concern for divine justice. As the church, our mission is to spread this message of repentance and hope, preparing hearts for the Lord's return. Understanding the apocalyptic visions, not as an invitation to fear, but as a call to attention and action, is crucial. God desires us to be vigilant, aware, and most importantly, living in a way that evidences to the world the faith we hold in our hearts. The waiting for the second coming of Jesus is not passive. It is an active waiting, like preparing to welcome someone of great esteem into our home. Cleaning, organizing, dressing up, doing everything so that this person perceives how awaited and loved they are. With Jesus, the procedure is the same. We prepare ourselves by living lives that reflect his love, lives of holiness, away from sin, and full of attitudes that manifest our commitment to divine justice. As the church, we have an immense mission to spread the message of repentance and hope. There are many people who have not yet discovered the truth, who have not yet experienced in their hearts the hope we possess. Our task is to prepare the hearts of these people, showing them that there is a real and living hope and that hope is personified in Jesus Christ. As we advance toward the climax of human history, as outlined in scripture, our testimony as Christians becomes crucial. We are called to be lights in the darkness, ambassadors of the kingdom of God, proclaiming the hope of the gospel to every corner of the earth. Our lives should reflect the love of Christ, attracting others to salvation before the doors of grace close definitively. We are living in a unique moment in history where each passing day brings us closer to the great encounter with the Lord. In this journey, our mission and responsibility as Christians could not be clearer. We need to let shine not our own light, but allow the light of Christ to shine through us. We are called to be the light in the midst of the world's darkness, where there is pain, suffering, injustice, and sadness. It is precisely in these moments that our light must shine even brighter. Delving into the scriptures has never been more essential. The prophecies and signs of the times narrated in the sacred pages invite us to a deeper understanding of divine purpose. Diligent study of the Word of God is not only a journey of personal spiritual growth, but also a fundamental tool in the mission of evangelization and discipleship. By familiarizing ourselves with the scriptures, we are better equipped to address the concerns and questions of those seeking to discern the times in which we live. We are immersed in an era that demands increased attention and a heart in tune with the Word of God. Exploring the depths of Scripture is a daily imperative, transcending the boundaries of a Sunday practice. The Bible is the beacon that lights our path, offering answers to questions that sometimes seem insoluble. Understanding the prophecies and signs of the times is vital, not to speculate dates or predict the return of Jesus, but to adopt a more conscious and prepared posture for what is to come. The church, 
the body of Christ, has an irreplaceable role in guiding believers toward the awaited return of the Lord. Through teaching, worship, fellowship and service, we strengthen each other in faith, offer mutual support in adversity and cultivate holiness together. The church should be a beacon of hope and a sanctuary of peace in the midst of life's storms, constantly reminding us that our hope is not anchored in the uncertainties of this world, but in the promise of an eternal home that awaits us. The magnitude of the church's mission in the divine plan is immeasurable. As members of the body of Christ, we are entrusted with a special mission in these turbulent times. It is within the church, in this sacred space of love and faith, that we gather to deepen our understanding of God's expectations, to praise the Lord with authenticity and passion, to share life's vicissitudes in brotherhood, and to serve one another and the community around us with dedication. When we gather, whether to worship, study the scriptures, participate in cells or small groups, we are doing much more than following a spiritual routine. We are strengthening the foundations of our faith and equipping ourselves to face the challenges that precede the glorious return of our Savior. Life undoubtedly presents its storms, and there are moments that seem insurmountable. But it is in these moments that the church emerges as a beacon of hope and a sanctuary of peace, reinforcing the reminder that we are not isolated in this journey. Prayer and intercession become increasingly essential as we approach the end times. Through prayer, we establish a connection with the heart of God, seek His guidance for our lives, and intercede for those who do not yet know Him. Prayer strengthens us spiritually to face challenges and enables us to be instruments of transformation in the world. We are going through a time that requires bent knees and hearts turned towards heaven. Prayer, this sincere dialogue with God, is the link that connects us directly to the heart of the Father. When we pray, it's not just a monologue, it's an exchange. God speaks to us as much as we speak to Him. In this communication, we find guidance, comfort, and even correction for our lives. Interceding for others is one of the noblest actions we can perform, as if we were extending their hand towards God, showing that there is someone in need of His love and hope. Prayer prepares us to face adversities because as we pray, we strengthen ourselves and are filled with the Holy Spirit, which provides us with a solid foundation to face the challenges that arise. Praying does not mean that we will be exempt from problems, but that we will have a transformed perspective on them, armed with the peace that only God can offer, the peace that surpasses all understanding. Vigilance is the key word for Christians in all times, especially now. We must be alert to the deceptions of the enemy, the temptations of the world, and the subtleties of sin that seek to divert us from the narrow path. Being vigilant means being aware, prepared and active in faith, not just passively waiting, but actively living according to the principles of the gospel. It is our responsibility as part of the body of Christ, to keep the light of truth shining, serving as an example and guide to those around us, knowing that our journey is guided by God's hand and sustained by His infinite grace. Being attentive to opportunities to witness and serve, ready for every good work that God places before us, is crucial in a world full of distractions where the path to eternal life can be easily obstructed, our vigilance becomes indispensable. The enemy, aware of our weaknesses, is always lurking, trying to divert us. However, by the grace of God, we are not alone in this struggle. Being vigilant transcends mere observation. It implies having heart and mind aligned with the Word of God, using the spiritual armor provided by the Lord to resist the temptations and deceptions of this world. Being vigilant also means being active in doing good, 
seizing divine opportunities to witness his love and serve others, acting as the hands and feet of Jesus on earth. How often do we let the chance to offer a word of comfort or a gesture of love pass us by because we are too busy or distracted? On the journey towards eternity, we are accompanied by the communion of saints, those who have gone before us and those who walk with us, a source of encouragement and strength. By sharing our experiences, struggles, victories, sorrows and joys, we become part of the great cloud of witnesses that encourages us to persevere in the race set before us. This journey of faith is full of beauty, and although we may feel isolated at times, the truth is that we are never alone. There is a special communion happening around us, often invisible, but always present. Throughout history, countless brothers and sisters in Christ have walked this world, facing adversities and celebrating victories, living out their faith in such impactful ways that they have left eternal marks. Now, as part of this great cloud of witnesses, they watch over us, cheer for us, passing us the baton and encouraging us to continue. But the communion of saints is not limited to those who have passed on. It manifests here and now in every church gathering, prayer group, cell meeting or post-worship conversation. Every time we share life, we strengthen this communion, offering and receiving strength to keep moving forward, even in the face of tribulations and challenges that the end times present, our hope remains steadfast in the promise of eternal glory, not anchored in the transient circumstances of this world, but in the eternal reality of the kingdom of God. As heirs of salvation, we await not only the return of our Lord, but also the consummation of all things, where we will dwell forever in the presence of God. We live in times that for many seem marked by tribulation and challenges. However, amidst all this, we have an anchor, an unshakable hope that does not change with the seasons or the news that circulates. This hope is anchored in something much greater than any experience in this world. It comes straight from the heart of God, a promise of eternal glory, of a home where there will be no more crying, pain or goodbyes. We do indeed await the return of our Lord Jesus, but also the consummation of all things. Imagine living in a reality where God's love fills everything, where peace is a constant experience. That is what we are walking towards and it keeps us standing, even when everything around us seems to be knocking us down. The Great Commission, the command given by Christ to take the gospel to all nations, resonates today with an unprecedented urgency. Every Christian is a bearer of this divine mission, tasked with sharing the good news of salvation found in Christ Jesus, making disciples in all parts of the world. This is our heavenly mandate, and we must embrace it with zeal and dedication, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. The words of Jesus, instructing us to take the gospel to all nations, sound with an inescapable urgency in our hearts. Never before in history has it been so feasible to reach the four corners of the world, whether through personal contact or through the internet and social networks. We have in our hands the necessary tools, and more importantly, the divine mission engraved in our hearts, a flame ignited by Christ himself. All of us, regardless of age or background, are called to this wonderful task of sharing the good news. What extraordinary news we have to proclaim. Salvation is in Christ Jesus. There is hope for humanity, and there is a love that has triumphed over death. We are talking about a truth capable of transforming lives, restoring broken hearts and altering eternal destinies. Making disciples in all nations is a task of immeasurable magnitude. We have the opportunity to impact the world and be part of someone's eternal story. This is not a burden, it is a privilege, an honor, something that should fill our hearts with joy and propel us to live in a way that reflects God's unconditional love. 
Our heavenly mandate comes with a glorious promise. Our work in the Lord is not in vain. Every prayer, every conversation about Jesus, every act of love inspired by the gospel carries an eternal value in heaven. We are called to be sowers of the word, watering the seeds planted with faith and love, knowing that in due time, God will make them grow and bear fruit. Let us embrace this mission with zeal and dedication, being faithful to this divine calling. In the end, we will be able to look back and contemplate the wonderful fruits generated through our simple obedience. As the final events unfold, it is crucial that we awaken to the spiritual reality that permeates our existence. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Recognizing this truth prepares us to face spiritual battles with the armor of God, standing firm in faith and powerful in prayer. Our greatest challenges transcend what we can see and touch. The Bible reminds us that the true struggle is in the spiritual realm. The forces of evil, active since the beginning of human history, seek to divert us from the right path. Recognizing this spiritual reality is the first step in properly equipping ourselves for the battle. It is not with physical strength, but with the armor of God described in Ephesians 6. Truth, righteousness, readiness of the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God, that we face the enemy, all grounded in prayer, our direct line of communication with the Father. This moment in history is more than a warning. It is a divine invitation to transformation. God calls us to step out of complacency, to renounce the works of darkness, and to live as lights in this world, anticipating the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us always be ready, living in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that, whether in life or in death, we may witness the glory of God. God, in his infinite wisdom and love, calls us to a life that goes far beyond what we can imagine. It is not a call to follow the flow of the world, but to renounce the works of darkness and live as lights, bringing hope, love and transformation to those around us. It is to live out the essence of the gospel, anticipating a glimpse of what eternity with God will be like. How do we become this light? by living in a manner worthy of the gospel, in every word, attitude, and choice, reflecting Jesus. Thus, whether in joy or in sorrow, in health or in sickness, in life or in death, we can witness the glory of God. Let us accept this divine invitation with open hearts, choosing daily to be light, to follow Jesus, and to be ready to celebrate eternity in the glorious presence of God. So be it.